Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Niche Nonsense. Sometimes, if you're lucky, while scrolling through Craigslist or Eventbrite or Instagram, you can stumble across a perfect little glitch in the universe that'll make you fall in love with free will again. A Shrek rave, a Ryan meetup, or maybe a man eating rotisserie chickens by a pier in Philly for 40 days. Humans, strangers, putting a perfect sprinkle of chaos out into the world and committing to the bit. A few years ago, my friend and I were bored and scrolling for something, anything, even close to that happening in the neighborhood that day. It was getting desperate. There's an old Vonnegut quote in Cat's Cradle that peculiar travel suggestions are dancing lessons from God. And while a few pages deep, the gods dropped a needle down, cranked the volume, and lent out a hand. When you see a listing for drag queens providing live commentary of WrestleMania mid-afternoon at the local bar, you go. I know very little about wrestling, or drag for that matter. I was the wrestling's fake killjoy for most of my life, but earlier that week a friend had sent a video on kayfabe that melted away my cynicism. Yeah, it's fake, that's the point. Oh, no shit. Oh, you snob. Growing up is realizing even rock stars listen to pop, so I thought, fuck it, this could be a funny story. But still, I couldn't help wondering, why drag queens, why wrestling, why drag queens and wrestling? In my head, the Venn diagram of the two were completely separate circles. But we went. And it was hilarious, bizarre, and worth the gamble. And while faced with that seemingly confusing combination, it clicked into place. Here, with these two appearingly different art forms, comes a unique type of storytelling. One that blurs the lines between person and persona. It's something I started to think about that afternoon a few years ago, and as it brewed in the back of my mind, it's expanded to color how I look at every storytelling medium and all of entertainment and culture and my own life. But where this video really clicked into gear was while researching for my previous essay on the musician Dijon. In an interview, Dijon recommended this book called Mythologies by the French writer Roland Barthes. So I picked it up and in it I found an essay about wrestlers in the 1950s. Expecting a story of unitards and brawls, I instead saw parallels sprawling out in front of me. Barthes wrote, The virtue of all in wrestling is that it is the spectacle of excess and compared their audiences to men at burlesque shows. And in my mind, the Parisian fighters were suddenly WWE stars. He talked about the choreography of stories, the heroes and villains, and how those stories affect the actual people behind the performance and the wheels started to turn. And it started adding on to this idea I keep being drawn to, one I've been fascinated with as long as I've loved art. It's at the core of celebrity. It's what I think is the most compelling, complicated, and human part of all entertainment. Sports, comedy, wrestling, writing, anywhere an audience can be found. The ever-changing, ever-blurring line between the person and the persona. Who is the real person? Who is the performer? When does it matter and how do they feed each other? How do the myths we tell form our legends? It's an idea that's getting increasingly complicated with our growing access to once distant figures through social media. Can you believe there was once a time we didn't know what 10 items movie stars had in their bags? I've never seen Henry Fonda play Never Have I Ever. I want to explore how this idea is perpetually morphing, how to view it critically as an audience, and show how messy it can get. And then, how we can take these questions into our own lives and negotiate our relationships with who we are and who we perform to others. To understand how that performance paints how we're seen and who we actually become. It's a wild and weaving paradox. It fits right into the daily absurdity of this weird, messy space rock we're floating on that I love. So let's dive in head first like a high school cliff jumper. Why do we love when SNL cast members break? Is it because we see a glimmer of the real person beneath the stage makeup and probable Botox? We don't know them, but for a moment, maybe. Are the best athletes really just the best entertainers? The ones that know that the stat sheets are second to the stories. Is that why LeBron James moved to the Lakers? Was it to be seen amongst the greats, or to be closer to Hollywood? Closer to the storytellers and opportunities that create the legend? It doesn't hurt that he gets to free up time to go to commercial sets and establish his own production company. When you dig into the real power of fame in our stories, it's impossible not to look for the relationship between the myth and man beneath. And you realize how important the stories we tell and live out are to actual reality. Yes, LeBron is a great athlete, but he understands the narratives around it. He's the chosen one. He plays into the idea of being the king. Every game he throws up chalk in front of a sea of photographers like he's about to free solo the Staples Center. That doesn't make him better at the sport, but it gives audiences what they want and it fills seats. It creates an icon. Playing the part, 
confirms the perception. LeBron's value is that yes, he's good, no shit, but it's also that he draws people in. The stats matter, but the stories matter more. To LeBron, to the fans, to the sport in general. Sports broadcasters and managers are showrunners of a semi-real, semi-orchestrated stage performance happening in real time. The teams are the cast trying to find enough chemistry to get renewed. They're trying to find an audience that'll pay to watch the show. They're creating storylines that materially impact the way audiences show up to the stadiums and the players that are picked for the limelight, which managers to pressure and which players to watch. It creates drama on and off the court. And like when the WWE writer's room decides to make John Cena win a title, it doesn't just impact the character of John Cena, it makes the real John Cena get more famous, get more acting roles, get more money. The persona directly impacts the life of the person. LeBron makes just as much from endorsement deals, commercials, movie deals as he does from the game itself. And in that sense, LeBron's skills are not much different to actors, singers, and wrestlers. In post-game interviews, he's crafting the story of a season, of himself, with the sole purpose of entertainment, like an actor on a press junket making you care about them so you care about the movie. And here's where it gets a whole other level of complicated with social media, where the audience performer gap closes in quicker than a jaded IT worker on a pizza party. It makes you think you know the artists and entertainers, but also at the same time smelts them into some weird digital idea for you to project yourself onto. And if you spend too much time with the idea of the persona, fans can get detached from the real person behind it. An already blurry, bizarre line is this. Some artists know how to swim in the sewage water of social fandoms. Phoebe Bridgers is online enough to be able to roll with the weird quirks and landmines of her audience pretty well. Maddie Healy tries to negotiate his rock star persona to be some sort of performance art to separate himself as a way to create a barrier. But he still often bounces between earnest and ironic in a way that shows he's still figuring it out. And hard as you try, the audience still has its own power. Entertainers and audiences both should be exploring this bizarre relationship. Anyone who's been to concerts post-pandemic knows that crowds have gotten universally worse as people have forgotten their own ways of interacting with public and private life after years inside. Speaking of inside and bad transitions, for my money, Bo Burnham has explored the themes I'm wandering through better than anyone out there. His entire career is about modern life being this weird balancing act constantly battling against the need to perform our own lives. At the end of Make Happy, he says, is that if you can live your life without an audience, you should do it. With eighth grade, he explores how this is shaping younger kids who crave audience as a replacement for belonging, trying to balance becoming their own person versus performing it. I have a theory why he's so good at pulling back the curtain on this idea, but that's another video. Simple fact is, he understands the internet better than any other comedian or academic and what it does to us on a psychological and more so spiritual level. But are our online performances inherently hollow? Are they disingenuous by default? No, I don't think they have to be, but I do think we should think critically about the ripple effect they can have. Does our performance of self online and offline also play into who we actually are? Does claiming to be something start a self-fulfilling chain that makes it be? Ye old fake it till you make it. Okay, take this example. I wanted to be a concert photographer for a bit, so I started telling people I was one. I went and shot small free shows without asking and built a kind of fake portfolio. Then I emailed a band's manager from a fake publication saying I was a concert photographer, and they gave me a press pass. And by saying I was one, I became one. And then I started getting gigs now that I had experience. A performance became a reality. There are limits. I can't just say I'm an astronaut or I'm from Antarctica and it be real. I'm not George Santos and I can't be Elvis just by saying so. But also, young Sally Ride did, at one point, say to herself, I will be an astronaut, then did all the steps an astronaut should do over the course of decades and ended up in space. But does that also extend to daily life? To be a kind person, maybe all you have to do is simply be kind. You act kindly, do kind acts, and then you are kind, in theory. Say you want to be a good friend. What would a good friend do? Call and check in? Does the person on the other end of the phone care if it's spurred by the wanting to be a good friend? No. They'll still feel like you're thinking and caring about them, so you are in fact being an actual good friend. Maybe this is kind of blurring performance with action, but I do think there's something in there. In some sense, all of life is a bit of a performance, and we're doing our best to play a part. And one way or another, we'll be known as something, for a little while at least. 
so I think it's worth trying to exert some intention into it. How much intention becomes a much larger question, and where we start to see some of my favorite art fall out of. In Synecdoche, New York, a playwright, trying to blend the way he sees the world and how he performs in his daily life, starts creating a true-to-life play that starts to spiral. The play grows a life of its own until he's overseeing a sprawling mini-metropolis, a set the size of city blocks fills with stage doubles of himself and his loved ones, each constantly being swapped and rewritten in a futile attempt at control. Fact and fiction blurs and bends until you can't tell the few apart. It's one of my favorite existential crises to date. It's what Nathan Fielder's The Rehearsal tries to tackle in a documentary style, obviously playing into the comedy, but it's grounded by a real truth. What if we can rehearse how we perform our version of ourselves? What if we can take away the stakes first? And it works because, while well, he takes it to an absurd, insane Andy Kaufman as Willy Wonka-like level, we do all know that we're performing in even our smallest interactions. We're performing when we confess that our educational history is a fraud, or when we're parenting children. Nathan presents mundane reality as a new method acting technique, and the performance of a life as a role, and he starts a school around it. And that school itself is a film performance that's waiting to be recast. The word meta had a breakdown when this episode aired. Nathan's been exploring how to push and bend this line for years now, seeing how much the character of Nathan Fielder can get away with by putting a camera in front of people and seeing how that changes their interactions with absurdity. Does it mess with their usual performance of self? How far will they go to maintain how they want to or usually present? And that's why I was blown away by the way season one ended. Spoilers, obviously. Or the performance genuinely blurred reality of the child actor who started to believe the performance of family was family. And Nathan is faced with the larger ethical questions of this whole idea, outside of the comedy. It's no longer about saving money on a rebate. It's a kid's idea of home. It shows how messy and constantly changing the line between person and persona gets. Nathan has to completely drop the act. He has to go back again and again to adamantly make sure the kid knows it's a performance, a role, make-believe. But we're still not quite sure he does. If you loved the rehearsal and aren't like a brainwashed man in a public library, scared of reading, I'll be refreshing your letterboxes to make sure you watch close-up as soon as possible. I'll give you five to ten business days from the moment I stop rambling. Close Up is an Iranian movie by Abbas Kiarostami that was just ranked number 17 on Sight & Sound's top 100 of all time list. And it's understated, underrated, and quietly wild. It's a docu-fiction with a reenacted true story, where the reenactors are the actual people involved in the original case, down to the judge. It's essentially the story of a poor man telling a random rich family on the street that he's Martin Scorsese, but the Iranian equivalent, Hussein Makhmalov. And not only do they believe him, they invite him over. And he visits their house multiple times and even borrows money for a cab as Martin Scorsese and starts telling them about all the projects he, Martin Scorsese, is dreaming up. And don't worry, they'll be in them too because he is Martin Scorsese after all. That is until someone tells them the dude almost living with them obviously isn't Martin Scorsese. So they kick him out and sue the man. And then after all this happens, Karastami steps in. He meets the man in jail and convinces them all to film a recreation of the whole ordeal, playing themselves, including acting alongside the man who just scammed them. It's wild. And then, Kiristami blurs the line even more by, spoiler, bringing the real Iranian equivalent of Scorsese over to the house to meet the man and the family. And while the man is sobbing, meeting his hero, you find a real, genuine moment in the midst of an elaborate reenactment. Showing that life does find a way, even when you try to script things. Showing the limits of how much we control how the performance affects reality. There's always a line to how far we can orchestrate before life takes the wheel. You hear it time and again from directors and musicians, these happy little accidents that emerge when you leave room for life. You rehearse something for five months straight, but on the opening night, something new accidentally emerges that's better than anything you could have imagined. And that's what's so fascinating about this energy exchange of reality and stage and personas, all interacting right on the razor's edge. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the person, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the performer, are different, but intrinsically linked. Just as RuPaul, the drag performer, is different from their off-camera self, yet their performances influence how people see them as a person. And in that, what you present is partially who you become. 
It's a winding, clashing paradox, and it's so damn interesting. Some can separate the identities better than others, just like some accountants are better at leaving work at home than others. I think the more we dig into the relationship between character and persona in celebrity culture, the better we can be at taking entertainers as what they are, and then maybe ourselves too. We're not in control, but we have some control. We live in an era that constantly demands us all to perform in different ways. We have to negotiate how we interact with that fact for ourselves, whether we like it or not. The goal is peace with the path, striving because we like the journey as much as the destination. I think we can learn strategies from celebrities, from wrestlers, drag queens, athletes, and comedians. Maybe we can harness the power of persona to reach goals, or to present as the person we'd like to become. But also, we can know the pitfalls to avoid. Especially online where algorithms can harden our positions and trap us inside of narrowing boxes that can alienate us from who we are in this moment. Knowing that who we are is malleable is valuable. Have you ever had a relative that you haven't seen in a while give you a gift related to something you gave up years ago? Like you're 20, but they still think you really love dinosaurs? You feel like that person doesn't know you. So be careful being too attached to who you present. Notice what qualities you see as immovable parts of yourself and be open to change. If I break my arm, I don't want to spend my life as the broken bone guy. I want to heal and move past it. We're constantly in flux, but surrounded by artifacts that can make us feel like a fixed version at all times. I think that we should all make sure we're intentional about how we interact with those paradoxes. The stories we tell about ourselves and to ourselves matter. I think really the goal is to live a life where the performance doesn't feel like acting. The goal is getting beyond it and to let go. But you have to know the potential power these things can have before you get to that. You have to name something to face it. What you present can be who you are. So maybe present that you are someone who is ever changing. Someone who is kind, joyful, and silly. Someone who sends good memes and dances when they're home alone. When you're aware of the performance itself, you're offered a chance to think about how you construct your life. There might not be an answer, but maybe in the question, you can find joy in the chaos and peace where you land. At times, I don't know if there's a difference between faking it and being it. One creates the other. So what I ask is this. Let us all be purposeful in who we pretend to be until we no longer have to pretend to be. Thanks for watching.